Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Spring Office Hours. I'm your host, Dan Vega. With me, as always, is my good friend and co-worker, Deshaun Carter. How are you, my friend? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Uh, we were news. just doing a thing, and yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I realized on that other spreadsheet that we were talking about, uh, uh, one of the presenters is my good buddy, Madav, uh, who I've oh. worked with before. So yeah, that, everything works out. Everything works awesome. out. Happy awesome. New Year. Uh, how was your holidays? How did what did you do over the holidays? Can you fill me in on some. I hope you got some like rest and relaxation and 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 got some work in a little bit of tinkering maybe. What'd you do? Yeah, uh, but you know we're we're moving in, re rebuilding stuff. Lots of projects. Uh, I got started with a lot of projects. Uh, I wrapped up a couple. Uh, yeah, did some little you know networking. Uh, you know, I had to do the get the crimpers out, and you know cutting cables and and patching and all that good stuff uh so that's always fun you know it's always like good to to refresh those yeah skills uh get those tools out every once in a while yep. at least once a year right mm -hmm. and uh yeah did some cool raspberry pi projects uh we're awesome. doing some cool stuff i will be collaborating with mario uh on some cool raspberry pi sensor stuff uh, in the near future and uh yeah lots you know of little stuff you know, we mentioned it before, but we have to like put this down in a note somewhere. But we need to get our good friend Mario on this show and talk whatever he's willing to talk with us because we could definitely pick his brain for an hour about a lot of things. So we'll see if we can't make that happen. Well, uh, with that, I will go ahead and shout out tomorrow. Mario and I are going to be on right around the same time, a little half hour earlier. Uh, nice. We're going to be doing a code session. Uh, awesome. Just another Tanzu TV. Uh, show that we've done in the past and we've kind of had a hiatus uh but we're gonna bring it back for 2023 cool one of the things that's happening and i'm gonna be doing that tomorrow uh, with mario we're gonna be doing uh some coding and we're actually gonna do the uh code with me in intellij uh, awesome so we'll, we'll pair on the same application and and talk our way through so it that's be pretty fun. cool yeah i'm gonna definitely check that out yeah if you haven't checked out code yet um this is more of us talking and showing off some demos code is let's just get in there and Code. And code. Let's write some code and, and talk about it there. So cool. Excited to see that. Um, yeah, I always love the holidays because, you know, it's fun being around family and friends. And, you know, I, I got little ones at home, so they love Christmas. But, um, you know, it's always a time for me to kind of reset. Even if it wasn't, you know, we had, we had a lot of family and it wasn't a like relaxing time. It is a reset time for me. 
And so today we'll spend some time talking a little bit about, you know, reflections on 2022, you know, what we learned in 2022, what we did that was exciting. And I like to take that and kind of carry it into the new year. What am I excited about in 2023? Not necessarily new year, new me goals type of thing, but like, I like to go, what, what am I excited about? What am I inspired to work on this year? So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Cool. Happy New Year's, guys. Uh, Thanks, welcome Benjamin. Welcome back. Always good to see you. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about a couple things, and then we'll get into the calendar. So next week, we are going to be together in person for the first time in a while. Yeah. I'm excited about that. We are at Code Mash. Uh, so if you are heading to Code Mash and you watch the show, you are a unique person. We want to talk to you. <laughs> so yeah. find us at find us at Code Mash and uh, let's talk some code. But yeah, we're uh, gonna be in Sandusky, Ohio, which is you know what? about an hour from me. Um, a lot farther from Deshaun. Yeah. I am going to do I have time? Do we have time to get some stickers? We should get some office hour stickers. Some swag, up, huh? I think. I, no, some spring office hour stickers. I'm going to make that yeah. happen. So I'm doing that right now because that's the way I work. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> pop out that thread and we're going to get some spring office hour. So if you are at Code Mash, we're going to have some stickers for you. Come find us. That's awesome. I'm making the stickers right now. Yeah. So we are at Code Mash next week. Uh, we are giving a workshop on an introduction to Spring. So a four-hour workshop with basically uh, you're new to Spring. How do you get up and running? How do you get started? We're going to talk about um, all the fundamentals, how to build a REST API, how to connect to a database, how to push to production. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're excited about that. I'm also giving a talk on Spring for GraphQL. Uh, excited about that. As always, with any in-person event, I'm just excited to see a bunch of people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so excited to like see the people, hallway track, uh, get inspired to, you know, I always get inspired when I come home from, from a conference to, to just work on that next thing or, or use that next technology that I haven't had a chance to yet. So I love being in person. I can't wait for next week. Uh, I'm... I'm going through, welcome back everybody. It's good to see kind of our, our friendly faces, our regulars. We definitely appreciate you. We got some good questions already. Uh, I have been spending a lot of time on Stack Overflow, trying to answer questions over there. Uh, and I saw something similar to this uh, over on Stack Overflow. So I think this is something that we'll have to come back to. Uh, but yeah, happy new year. Everybody. Yeah, so Spring Authorization Server is a big one on my list. So I have a list of a mile long of, of tutorials to work through. Um, I would say Spring Authorization Server is at the top of things I get requested for. So that's going to be coming soon. Uh, I, again, we just have a lot going on in, in January. So <laughs> I think I have like six or seven presentations that I got to work, work through, but uh, that is definitely at the top of my list. <clears throat> I'm going to invite Rajiv. Um, I have a, a little example uh, that's using Spring Authorization Server, Spring Cloud Gateway, along with uh, Redis uh, for session management. Uh, if that sounds interesting, uh, maybe reach out to me direct on on Twitter and we can pair and we can talk about, about that more. Yeah, and why don't you and I, you know, you and I are going to sit down next week. We'll be in person together, like I said, and we're, we're starting to think about the future episodes of this show and come up with some kind of content ideas. You know, a lot of this is getting questions from you guys, but uh, we do have some themes for episodes. We should make a spring authorization server episode. Uh, if we can't talk about it, we can always get somebody on to talk about it with us, but that would give me some extra push to get a tutorial done by then. And we can kind of show yeah. it off on this show. So well, I'll let's... go ahead and explain what I'm doing, right? I, I like Redis. Yep. I do the Raspberry Pi stuff. Uh, so trying to get all of this running on Raspberry Pi. My kids have set up their uh, websites. Uh, so they're doing the same thing, just kind of practicing. And what we're going to do is we're going to put authorization server in there. So that's we're awesome. going to allow some stuff to be public. And then they can have some stuff that's, hey, we got to know who you are in order to, yep. to see it. Because they're kids. Uh, awesome. So we'll have... Definitely that example will be out real soon. Art, welcome. Cool. Always good. 
Awesome. So yeah, so we're working on the schedule. We're not sure um, what what the plan is for next week yet, but we're working on it. We are working on just um, kind of what we want to do with this show. And we, we're not going to talk about it just yet, but we do have some good plans for this show. Um, so stay tuned. And thank you guys for showing up every week. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I've been wanting a Raspberry Pi for years too. I'm just one of those things I've never gotten around to. And I remember last year when I asked you, this, you know, you can't buy one now, but you had a stack of like eight of them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was one of the projects. Uh, can I happy? Like I've, I've got something behind there. There's, uh, there's oh, nice. unopened, unopened, <laughs> uh, Raspberry Pi four there, unopened Raspberry Pi four down there. I got some, some cool kits that I'm going to be working on with, with Mario. Uh, and then I have a couple of clusters. So I got a cluster of nice. Yeah, I got a couple. You can see it all, all the stuff on Deshaun.com. You can get that. That's awesome. There. Um, I did want to mention, I think I mentioned this last time, but man, your office is coming along really well. Um, I have to fix the audio. I got I to gotta fix the audio. So I got a little bit of an echo. But sounding baby steps, good. It's coming yeah. Along. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a great approach to have. Like people want to just come in and like, oh, let me just like, completely go from nothing to like the greatest setup in the world it's like that's not how it happens like baby steps like kind of change one thing tweak one thing it's the same thing if we were to go in the gym you wouldn't throw an extra 50 pounds on the bar you you know take a little bit of an incremental step and and get there right so yeah awesome Lo love the love the look um and then that you're using the uh, iphone now too on one of your cameras on one this so one. this not this one but yeah i am using yeah. the iphone uh yeah, multi-angle yeah doing all kinds of stuff easy i have four cameras wow. set up i got a little project camera for when i'm doing the raspberry pi stuff yeah uh, uh that's a raspberry pi camera right there that <laughs> i'm looking at uh it's on a raspberry pi zero that's awesome uh and then i have yeah the iphone and where's the other one? one two three oh and then the the built-in one that's awesome yeah. yeah that was that was on my list to kind of dial in like start working on upgrading the audio and video of my office over break but never got to it so. yeah well, there's a really really good spring developer on twitch uh i don't remember how to say and his name, his, name is not, his name's not ted uh it's an, another <laughs> there's another good spring developer <laughs> Uh, I'll put the link in the show notes. Cool. Uh, but he has this cool setup where he's doing, he's got all his, his uh, monitor set up. And then every once in a while, he switches to a, a behind the scenes look. So he's looking, you're looking back uh, at his back and you see his fancy oh, yeah. setup. Uh, and I just like it because it's, he doesn't like make any big announcements about it. But every once in a while, you just kind of get a different studio view. Yeah, uh, Greg. Just, uh, it, Greg Turnquist says that too. Greg. Greg has a couple different cameras, and he's got his switcher, and he switches back and forth. So, yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah, I gotta. If you get, if you get a chance, put that uh, link in the description because yeah. I'd like to check that out as well. Um, yeah. here we up. Oh, here we go. We're doing stuff. Yeah. Authorization tour. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to. We'll put we got you notes. a new episode of Spring Office Hours. That's Boom. what we got you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Can we ask questions? Yes. That's what you're supposed to do. Ask questions, bring it, set up your question, let us know about it and we'll talk about it. That's yep. exactly what we're here for. We are here for you. We would, I would love to come into a show and have nothing but questions and just be able to talk about what you guys are working on and get you unstuck. That would be wonderful for me. Um, what else we got here? Nice kids. Yes. Kafka. If you know Mario, you know that he likes the messaging. We're going to be doing all of the Kafka and MQTT and Redis and all the things. Uh, let's see. Hey, Russ. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see Happy you. Happy New Year, Year Russ. Uh, again, everybody loves Dan's. Ooh, Dan's. Lambda. Yeah, the Lambda functions. Uh, some cool stuff happened at the end of last year with AWS Lambda, so check that out. Yes, we're going to do lots of fun stuff. And that... Yeah, we'll come, we're going to circle back to that as, as we talk about what's happening. Uh, Kote does the switching also. Kote uh, is a superstar. We're always learning from Kote. Yes, keep doing your stuff. Uh, spring security. We got to get to the spring security. Yeah. 
you know, just uh, to kind of touch on that topic for a while, I heard, I've heard a bunch of really good feedback over the last like couple months saying that spring security is usually this like daunting thing that I need to learn. It's a little bit overwhelming and that my videos have been helping. So thank you for those kind, those kind words. And that's really what it is. I mean, you got to take it one step at a time. It is spring security on itself is a huge project. There's a lot to learn there. Take it as we did with Deshaun's office here, incremental baby steps at a time um, and, and you'll get there. So. so here's Dan's question. Can you send a nested object form data with list of nested object with multi-part files in Spring Boot REST API? So what I think I'm hearing is like, hey, I, I fill out some form data and then I also want to upload an image with that form. Can you do that? Of course we can do that. Yeah. What, what are we running into? That's what I'd like to know. Like, what's the problem that you're facing? Uh, if you've got a gist or something that we can take a look at, we will happily, I will happily take whatever you can share with us uh, and help you get it working. So that brings up a good point. We've done this in the past. We've done this on shows. We're like, hey, I've got a question. And they shared us their Git repo or they shared us a little uh, gist. We can take that. You know, We might not have the question for you while we're talking on the show here, but I will happily take a GitHub repo that you can share where you're at, current progress, or something that's similar, uh, and and work on it for you. Be happy to, especially for something like this. Or if you've got a Stack Overflow question out there, send us a link. Let us yep. help. Yep. Those are usually the best way to get us these complicated scenarios. It's just looking at that question. Yes, you should be able to do that. Uh, sounds like it's probably going to end up being some type of <clears throat> Jackson deserialization issue, but... I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I know that I've done this in the past. I'm trying to think of where that project, where an example project might be. Uh, it'd probably be an older version of Spring, uh, but I'm, I shouldn't be too hard to find. I'm sure I've got one sitting around somewhere. Yeah, and the best, um, you know, with any project, I always say the more verbosity you can get in the logging, so change like your log levels to, you know, trace or debug, um, turn debugging on. The more you can get out of that log, that council telling you what's going wrong, uh, that'll point you to the problem. And then, then it's just trying to figure out why it's complaining about that. Um, and now that he brings that up, maybe that's something that we can add into our workshop. Let me see if I can figure that out and throw it into our workshop so we can have an example we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, Benjamin says, hey, let's talk about cloud development for both Azure and AWS. I mean, there's others out there. We can talk about cloud development. Uh, I hope we have a project on Spring with Azure. Yeah, we, I'm a big fan of Azure. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned. Um, how about covering integrating metrics and logging and how it's done in a standardized fashion with Spring? Absolutely. Absolutely. Tell us more about like where you're thinking because we've talked about Spring, uh, the actuator that you get with Spring Boot. Uh, and we've also, episode 10, I know it off the top of my head because we talked about it, episode <laughs> 10, uh, we did go into logging and how you can adjust logging uh, changing by changing your properties and using the actuator to change logging in real time. Uh, so, yeah, what else would you like to see? Uh, I'm and, a fan of the Prometheus actuator endpoints so you can scrape. It's pretty standard. Doesn't have to be Prometheus in the back end, but yep. to capture. And we had Jonathan on from the Spring team who talked about all the logging changes in Spring Boot 3. Uh, so there is a lot that happened there. I also did a video on what's new in Spring Boot 3 where I covered some of those metrics and how to use them. So lots of exciting things in Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6. Spring Batch and Lambda out of the box integration possible in the near future, less than 15 minute batches. Nice, love that. Awesome. Yeah, if you saw our last, uh, last episode, we talked about Spring Batch. Uh, and my head definitely went down the path of, I always, when I hear Batch, I'm like, why is it Batch? Why is it not a stream or events? Uh, right. But, you know, there's, there's cases. Uh, and one of those cases for me was that uh, near time or like short term storage to uh, medium term storage to put it on ice. Uh, and sometimes... You don't want to stream that because of the, the cost uh, for sending data. Uh, hey, I want to take a snapshot of something uh, at this point in time and do a one 
transaction, one cost of ingress or egress or writing to that expensive store. Uh, and that's the example that I came up with. So yeah, we have some, some options, uh, lots of cool stuff coming out of that. Uh, what else we got here? Yes, cool. sending a link. Perfect. Hey, happy New Year. Happy, happy New, New Year, Year. everybody. Uh, what's it? Should you have a separate DTO class for update and create? That is a good so, question. Yeah, so th this comes up a lot. So, so DTOs and entities, let's talk about this real quick. So normally in like a spring application where you have like spring data, we, we refer to things as like entities. These entities are managing the persistence and retrieval of data with the database. So you define a customer entity, it has all the fields of a customer, and that's how we get data in and out of the database, right? DTOs are, all right, well, data transfer object, but all right, I have to do something and I have to do one thing. So in the case of, uh, I need to create a new customer. That may look very different than the entire customer entity, right? I may just have like five fields that I need to create a new customer. So I create a DTO for that. And the reason we do that is definitely, you know, going back to kind of single responsibility principle, I have one reason to change and that is I'm going to create a new customer. So my answer to that is there's not always, the, the, there's not always a blanket yes or no to that. If your create and your update look very similar, um, then you could probably combine them in the same DTO, like a save customer DTO, right? If there are very different rules for creating and updating a customer, then you would probably want to separate those out into different DTOs. Again, single responsibility principle says, hey, I only have one reason to change when I need to update a customer this is going. This code is going to change, and that way your tests kind of revolve around that. Um, so, as always, it depends. Uh, really depends on the situation, but I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I've seen it a lot more lately, where there's a clean uh, distinction between, hey, this is the uh, what the create looks like. These are the things you're going to create, uh, and this one update looks like. Sometimes, um, what, there's a lot of uh, cases, there's a lot of situations where you don't want to update something. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might limit uh, the fields that you're allowed to update versus the ones yep. that you're allowed to create with. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It's, it's always the right answer is it depends. So, um, so <laughs> if you're ever worried about the, oh, hey, I've got these two different objects, don't. Like, Hey, if it fits into one, great. If it doesn't, that's okay. <clears throat> yeah, and I always I always go back to testing. Like, get it to work first. So maybe you just have everything in one DTO. Um, and then when you start writing tests, you kind of get that smell going on. Like, oh, this doesn't feel right. Why am I doing this? So that, that usually changes everything for me. So. so we got a shout out for the Lambda Snap Start. Uh, which we talked about a few times, and then yep. this, Rajiv. Let's demystify OAuth 2 and OpenID with Spring Auth Server, because it is complex, and we need to understand mm -hmm. the internals. Um, yeah, maybe maybe not understanding the internals, but giving examples of where you might use one or the other, or what it looks like setting up one or the other. Uh, one of the things that I'm running into a lot with a lot of customers, a lot of you, is that, hey, for this part of the system, I want to authenticate this way. For this other part of the system, I want to authenticate this way, but I still want to use Spring Auth Server. Yeah, and it really depends on what your use case is too, right? Like you never, people people hear OAuth too and like think I need to immediately move to like an authorization server. And that, that's not always the case. I mean, I know a lot of people reach out to me saying like, how can I do an OAuth too? Like uh, log in, log in with Google, log in with Twitter, right? Like you don't need a separate authorization server if that's all you want to do. That's kind of baked right into uh, Spring Security. So, yeah, the, again, the, a lot. The majority of questions I get um, from people, whether it's on email or Twitter or on YouTube, is around Spring Security, because again, it is so vast. There are so many things you can do with it. So, we'll keep plugging along and uh, keep getting some content out there around that, and especially on this show. So, stay tuned. Yeah. Uh there was a question about 
Um, integrations. Is there anything special that needs to be done to integrate with third-party systems, uh, items such as New Relic, Datadog, Elk? No, nothing special. Go to start.spring.al and grab the starter. We have a starter. Uh, let's, let's see if we can share that. Actually, Dan, you have a screen up. Do you want to go to start.spring.al for me? Let me throw this off of here. Start.spring.io. Normally we talk about calendar.spring.io, but start, Datadog. Let's see that one first. Datadog, look at that. Oh, no space. No Oops, space. Sorry. Yeah, Datadog. Boom, right there. There's your starter. All the easy first level, hey, we're going to integrate for you. Uh, same, there's a starter for New Relic. You can pull that up. Uh... You can pull them up. You can pull both of them up. Boom. So we've we've done that. Again, one of the great things about the Spring ecosystem is those common use cases. That's what the framework is going to help you out with. Things that tons of people are doing, yes, you would expect to be able to find someone like that. So yeah, you can do those things. Uh, and you bring up Elk. Uh, one of the things that I've done in the past, which I'm still a big fan of, is... Uh, formatting my logs as JSON uh, so that I, I treat logs as events and those JSON logs make it really easy to consume, ingest, search, use in something like Elk or other. So yeah, great question. Oh, hey, will you talk about ahead of time engine features? Yes, I love to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I could uh, maybe provide uh, a link uh, to one of the talks that we've done recently about AOT versus just-in-time compiling with Spring Boot, but always happy, happy to circle back on that. Hey, what is, what is your preference? DTOs or maps? Do you have a preference? Uh, I found myself in that spot where I'm like asking myself, well, why don't I just use a map? It's so much, I get all this flexibility down the way, but I lose some of the constraints if I just use a map. Yeah. So I've, I've made that argument and it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, I've, you know, it's tough because now I'm in a role where everything I build is pretty trivial and small. I don't build, I'm, you know, it's been a year since I've worked on enterprise grade applications and then we are using a lot of DTOs, but things that I build, I honestly don't even build DTOs now because everything I build is so small that, I just use the ent entity itself, but um, yeah, again, it depends. What are the trade-offs? What's the pros and cons? There is no right answer. Uh, you know, uh, it's something that you have to kind of work through yourself and figure out like which which one should I go with. So. Yep, it depends on what you're doing. I like to validate things. I like uh, yeah, knowing what my data looks like. Uh, so when I'm writing my tests, I can validate objects easier uh, when yeah. you're using maps in a test. It's like, hey, does this map have this, 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 and this? Uh, right. Are the types valid, et cetera? Uh, can they be converted to, uh, et cetera? So yeah, yep. it, it's a, it's a trade-off. Yep. Uh, but there's also some cases where you're maybe um, consuming uh, uh, time series data uh, and you want to add labels or tags or something to your data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, there's different cases for both. I definitely lean into DTOs. And I do yep. provide that. I think it self-documents. Uh, it helps explain the system that I'm using or delivering. Yep. In production for, um, man, look at this. We are just answering questions. I know, I'm so happy. In production for config server as architecture aspects of a system, when do you spring config server and when do you use cloud provided config service? So that's a great question. Uh, here's one of the things that I've kind of explored lately. I'm definitely bringing a lot of uh, history and uh, experience using Spring Cloud Config, uh, Spring Cloud Config Server. Uh, I'm bringing that baggage with me. I've got a lot of projects that are already leveraging that. Uh, but what I'm doing now, a lot of my development is landing in Kubernetes. And Kubernetes has its own way of delivering configs with config mm -hmm. maps and secrets, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm finding myself not adding Spring Cloud Config Server into some of these newer projects or even taking it out and using something like the um, Spring Cloud Kubernetes uh, dependency so I can automatically, I can leave my, the way I'm consuming my clients with Spring Cloud Config's client part, uh, I can leave that in my projects 
uh, but I can swap out. So if I'm doing Docker Compose for a project and I have Spring Cloud Server in there, and then I move over to Kubernetes, all I'm doing is taking out the Spring Cloud config server uh, and all of my clients are going to get their information the exact same way. So I can set up my GitHub repositories the exact same way, uh, but I can deliver it to two different or two multiple different uh, types of environments that I'm running in production. So it's a good question. Uh, and again, it depends, but I'm definitely following those same, uh, the constructs. I'm using the Spring Cloud config uh, framework uh, in order to get my properties to my classes. Hopefully that helped. Does that make sense, Dan? I kind of rambled a little. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Does Spring have any solution to manage custom exceptions in a microservices environment? This is a good question. And I know that we talked about this. Uh, well, actually, maybe it wasn't on this show. Uh, how to handle exceptions and what are some of the patterns for exception? It's from your Spring recipes. I'll let, I'll let you jump into that if you want. Yeah, again, I, I don't know that it changes from a monolithic application to a microservice. It's, you know, it's going to be the same. It depends on what you're building, right? Um, there are ways to handle exceptions in Spring. There are, like many things in Spring, there are different ways to handle it. Uh, you can do it at a REST controller level. You can do it uh, for all of the controllers in a system. There are different ways to handle exceptions. Uh, and again, I'm just assuming you're building a REST API. Maybe that's not the case. Um, there are even some new uh, features in Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6 for problem details, uh, which is really nice, being able to provide more details about the problem that is happening. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really have an answer for you. There is nothing specific to a microservice, but there are different ways to handle exceptions. Um, I would just have to get a little bit more of a specific mm -hmm. question on what you're trying to do with them. I will uh, double click. I'll double click on this and say, <laughs> I don't like when I catch myself saying that, but uh, <laughs> the conversations that we've had on the show around observability, around tracing on a distributed system where you're using microservices, tracing is going to be a big part. And you're getting that with Spring Boot 3, you're getting that mm -hmm. built in. So it's really easy to implement tracing so that, hey, an exception happened. I can see it in my logs, but I can't tell what was really going on from that error log that I see. Right. If you have tracing set up, you can go and look and you actually see like, oh, it hit service A to service B to service C to service D that was actually in a different region that maybe timed out and that was the exception. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So we can just kind of build on top of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and yeah, capturing logs, having your logs set up properly. Uh, we can talk about some of this uh, into more in more detail uh, and circle back on the whole, like how do you do logging? What are some good patterns uh, for capturing metrics and observability and actually maybe give a demo. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, is there a project repo to learn Spring by doing real projects or program like 100 Days of Spring? Oh, that sounds like a great idea. 100 Days uh, of Spring? It's That's funny you mentioned this. I've, <laughs> I've been thinking about a course called 30 Days of Spring. So, um, yeah, I don't know that we would get to 100, but maybe we could put 30 together. <laughs> oh, but, man. Yeah, that seems like it'd be a lot of fun. And if you did like 100 days of spring, it seems like a lot, but actually if you broke it up into 10 different sections, that's really like 10 days of one thing. So yeah, um, we'll have to look at that. I have to look at some other repos and like what they do. Like if it's just a problem and try to solve this problem in spring, here's how we did it. And it's like a GitHub thing and that's just written. Yep. That's something we could work on this year for next year. You know, like that's well, something people start like at the beginning of a year. So, yeah. You know, uh, the way that I'm thinking about 2023, one of the ways I'm thinking about 2023 is uh, we have 52 weeks uh, and that means 52 shows. So if we're doing something every week, like we're halfway there. Yeah. Like maybe, yeah, maybe we sure. just circle back like, hey, day one and we can just kind of like, uh, yeah, lay them on and just add like, Days of spring, X days of spring, boom. Yeah. And and add to it. That might be something fun. Yeah. Uh, cool. But good question, good idea. Uh, and then here's one that says, oh, focus on serverless applications. Yeah. You could you could 
get that in there. Yep. We'll get a, we, we actually have not done a show on that yet. Um, so I've built a lot of content around that. Um, so we can definitely talk about that one day. Yep. Yes. Stay open to extension, but close to modification. Yes. All right. Is there anything? That was solid, oh, please. Solid. <laughs> Uh, is there anything you can share about incorporating Java fibers in spring? I don't know anything about Java fibers. Either do I. Is that a is that like a project loom thing? Um, like a thread thing? I'm not sure. We might have to ask our, our good friends. Yeah, if it's anything to do with threading, I mean, um, you can take a look at um, some of the new features in uh, JDK 18 around project loom. Um, there is a blog post on spring.io uh, about that. But again, that's very early on, uh, very early stuff. So, so friendly reminder, we are, you know, this is being streamed to a bunch of different places. Uh, so we bring the questions on so that we capture the questions uh, instead of from the, the chats that are happening in the different places. Uh, so we bring those questions on screen. Uh, and after the show, we're actually going back and watching the show and we're keeping track of the things that we are able to address, the things we're not able to address. And we hope to connect to you. So one of the things that you can do right now is you can go out to Twitter or LinkedIn or Mastodon or wherever, and you can uh, give us a shout out uh, and use hashtag uh, spring office hours so that we know if you've asked a question and we have a solution for you off hours, we know how to get a hold of you. Let us know that you're watching. Uh, give us a little shout out so that we can connect the dots if you've got questions. Hey, Deshaun, can we do a demo on Rest Docs in the future? How about tomorrow, same time? Uh, code <laughs> with Mario Gray. Uh, we're going to be doing some Rest Docs, like the delta from uh, creating a Rest API, uh, follow any of the guides that are on Spring.io, the delta to go from that. Uh, RESTful API to a RESTful API that's documented, uh, self-documented, and has tests that go along with it. It's like this big. It's, it almost makes me feel guilty uh, if I'm delivering something and not putting in REST docs. Like I, that's, that's the point where I'm at. It's like, ah, if, if I'm going to build a project and I don't put actuator, I'm like, why would you not add the actuator? It does a lot of the stuff for a lot of what we're doing. You're going to get a bunch of health checks out of the box. You're going to get a bunch of help out of the box. If I'm creating something that somebody else is going to use, I'm going to add the rest docs. That's just, that's just where I'm at. So yeah, join us tomorrow. Cool. Looking forward to it. Let's see. Best podcast on SP. Well, I would like to uh, maybe introduce a new candidate uh, for this. I think that we could maybe do something around that. I think right now uh, I've got two uh, that I'm regularly listening to. Yeah. How about you? A beautiful podcast for me mm, yes. with Josh. That's, that's my favorite so far. Always good. And it's not always just spring. He's yep. talking about kind of the ecosystem, and there's lots of uh, stuff that goes into an ecosystem that's this massive. Yep. Yep. I was I was fascinated to find out. I posted a link. We'll talk about it in a minute, but I posted a link to your conversation with Josh on a beautiful podcast, and I was fascinated to find out that people didn't know that it, it existed. I'm like, what? Come on, you're if you're in the spring <laughs> community, you need to know about a beautiful podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the other is. Greg's, Greg Turnquist. Yep. Like his content, I am just, I'm just a big fan. Uh, he does amazing. <laughs> and I've watched his videos and I've listened to it. Like uh, he does a good job. Like he, at least for me, he connects with me the way he, he talks. Knows he knows his stuff. And I just started reading his book last night. I finally yes. got a copy of it. I got it. I got the digital copy. I'm getting the actual hard copy soon. So I'm excited about that. Uh, we'll we definitely about share that out. Thomas Vitale's book. Uh, yep. I've started reading his book yep. uh, that just came out. And Great book. Yeah. So we're doing the, the reading. Uh, if you've got books that you want to share or podcasts that we don't know about, definitely throw them our way. Yep. Let's see what we got. Hi. Is it generally accepted that in REST endpoints, we should use DTOs instead of entities? You don't see it in spring tutorials. Has this approach changed? What do you think, Dan? So again, I I don't use a lot of DTOs these days because my the applications I build are fairly simple. 
Um, I always take the approach of get it to work first. So the easiest way to get it to work first is I just use the entity. If your application starts growing in complexity and you start having to manage, you know, the thing we talked about in the use case before, I have a separate endpoint for creating an update. In my case, I have four or five fields. I, I don't really need to change, you know, nothing's changing for me there. But when that complexity grows and you're starting to write tests in different scenarios for creating a new one or saving a new one, or I need to do X, Y, and Z business logic, that code smell will start to come out. And that's when I start going, okay, now I maybe need to think of a different approach. Again, the single responsibility principle, if you write it, your application, just unit, using entities, your tests, you're good to go, it's out in production, but you find yourself like changing this one thing all the time, and it's for this one specific use case, but that change is polluting the rest of your code. That's a code smelting. That's that's kind of like, all right, let's take a different approach here. So again, always I get things to work first and I make them better later. Um, and then these are like patterns that you start to pick up later as you after you do them a, a number of times. So. And, you know, uh, since we've been talking about this today, I'm going to add one other thing. I'm going to see if I can uh, bring it up here and, and draw it. Um, the idea that you recently did some work with the YouTube API. Uh, you can go look at the Twitter thread that was out there today. Um, those APIs, the RESTful APIs that you're consuming, they're not telling you what they're doing on the back end. They're not telling you if there's maps back there or, uh, or straight you know, entity objects or DTOs or other. They're not mm. explaining that. What you see uh, is typically some interface, uh, some form of data like JSON or XML or whatever. Like, hey, here's what the data is going to look like when you consume this endpoint or when you're right. uh, uh, yeah, sending stuff to this endpoint. You kind of know what the data looks like, but you don't know what those objects are on the, on the other side of the wall. Mm -hmm. But... There is the ability uh, with Spring integration where I can say, hey, I want to call that service over there. And I know that service is using this DTO, this version of this DTO that looks like this that I got from this library over here. Mm -hmm. You can actually do that. I would highly recommend that you don't start there. Don't limit yourself to where if you change a DTO that you're going to use across a uh, client and server mm -hmm. uh, or whatever communication that is. Don't do that to start. If right. you need that further down the road, then absolutely. But don't start there. Don't start uh, with that uh, yeah, hard construct where you're using the same DTO on both sides uh, of the message. Yep. If you're consuming something, consuming those YouTube uh, APIs, uh, you could just use maps. If you're just like, hey, I want to explore and I want to go and get this value from here and that value from there, you could do nested maps, maps of that, yep. and go and just get the data that you need and then continue working. Clean it up later by converting it to DTO. Yeah, and, and what's the use case? Again, I am getting data from an API and I may stick it in a database. I have 10, 12 records in place because that's all I need. I don't, I don't need DTOs for that. I just have 12 records and I can use those and stick them in a database and I retrieve information. I'm not actually um, updating or anything like that. So yeah, it just depends. Gerald, this type of comment, it, it means a lot. It's a great <laughs> way to start the year. Uh, yeah. We, we, we hope and we think that we're helping out uh, by the way that the questions are being asked and, and we get to follow along with some of our uh, regulars. We kind of see like, oh, hey, they're, they've moved on. They're, they're now into the, the 200 and 300 level questions. This is great. Thank you for the comment. Uh, hello, Ireland. Welcome. Hello. Uh, we need to, let's see, we need to use safe session filter in Spring Cloud Gateway before forwarding the request to downstream services. Why do we need to use safe session filter in Spring Cloud Gateway before? Um, I really don't know the oh, answer. That seems very specific. Yeah. It, I mean, it depends. Uh, what are you trying to do? Like, are you trying to send something that's going to be accessed from the session? Rajiv, I think you said that you were going to send a link uh, to what you're working on. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, this is like the ESPN of Spring. 
Great. <laughs> Great. I, I would love uh, Jalal. Uh, I hope I said that right. I would love to hear where you're at. Give us the highlights. Give us the box score of what you're working on right now and what you see uh, coming further down the schedule. I'd love to hear about what you're working on. Uh, what's, what's best practice when I want to make a property final and an entity cannot be updated? Again, I so I'm being very lazy these days, and I use records whenever I can um, because, again, that's an immutable object now. Once I create it, it cannot be changed. Um, but as far as best practice when I want to make a property final, I'm not sure I understand the question because when you make something final, it's final. That's I don't know the be best practice around that. So uh, maybe you can kind of talk a little bit more about what you're trying to do there, but um, yeah. Yeah, let me expand and see if I'm uh, on the same page. Uh, let's say I have a uh, repository, a data repository, uh, and I have some entity. Uh, I can either uh, code my entity to say, hey, this is immutable in some way. Uh, this will not take updates. I could do it that way. Or I could, uh, on the on the database, I can say this row or this column cannot be updated uh, right once, uh, or this row cannot be updated. Uh, can I do that with constraints? Um, yeah, but again, I think he's just, uh, we're getting into, is this object immutable or not? So yeah. yeah, if you're not gonna, if you use records, once you construct it, you can't make a change to a particular property. And so that's why I love records. They, anytime you have immutable objects in your system, less error prone, less uh, bugs can happen. Uh, if you don't have a record, you can go ahead and make a class um, that is immutable. So there are th some patterns to follow there, like uh, creating final variables. There are no um, setters. There's only getters. Um, usually that's how that happens. So... <clears throat> Here, uh, records are great, but I want some record mutable DTO and not use Lombok. That's what I'm missing in Java the most. Something between record and Lombok. Uh, I get it. I think that as you use records more, uh, you're going to find that what you're not doing is editing a record that you have uh, an instance of. Mm -hmm. I think that you're going to find that uh, if if you're doing APIs in this, you know, conversation yeah you're going to find that you don't have a a record uh that's being edited you're going to be getting a new uh set of data from somewhere yeah. that you will then write as a record can you share ideas on doing concurrent session control stuff with non-session based approaches probably with oauth tokens would like to restrict the number of logins per user in oh oh yes we can definitely get into that we can definitely get into that. Um, now, uh, with non-session based approaches, mm, that might be difficult. That might be difficult because if you don't have a session, how do you know if a user is logged in or not? Uh, so one of those big problems that, again, Spring solves for you in a lot of ways, uh, a lot of uh, the frameworks. We, we were talking about Vaden before the show. Uh, Vaden has this idea like, hey, when you log out, uh, you can actually log out and your session goes away so that you're, you know, maybe you had an OAuth token uh, and you were logged in, but to be sure that you're logged out across everywhere you need to be logged out, uh, that's one of those tricks. Uh, what's the difference between I'm logged out and I just haven't come back in a while? Yeah. Right? How do you know the difference? Uh, so Rajiv, you are, you are getting into uh, the edges here, uh, but this is exactly where we want to be. Uh, so yeah, we can talk about that more, but that, it gets it gets a little bit complex uh, to answer right here on the stream, but I would definitely like to follow up with you. Uh, I'm lazy too, records are the best. Like, let's go, like that's, that's what we do. Love records. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, here's a good one. What's the biggest contribution that moving from JEE to Jakarta makes to Spring Boot 3.x? 
So as far as, uh, well, I guess like the biggest thing is, hey, we're on Tomcat 10.1.1 or whatever that version is. We're on the newest version of Embedded Tomcat, which is great. I think the biggest contribution is that now we are on APIs that are going to evolve going forward instead of sitting on these APIs that have been stagnant for years. So yep. Now that we've made that jump to three, um, anytime that Jakarta moves forward, we can now move forward with it and see some of the exciting changes in those APIs. So I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, follow up. Yeah, sorry, not being clear. What are the pros of saving user session at Gateway before forwarding to downstream services? Someone from Spring Team is recommended, but not sure the reason. Um, saving user sessions at Gateway. Yeah, well, we can definitely follow in, but the idea, if, if you didn't save that user session at the Gateway and you did something else, what? What did you do? Is that mm. user session still valid? That makes sense. So when I'm picturing, uh, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, we can draw a picture. Uh, please hold. Uh, I think of that gateway as the front door to everything. Yeah. Uh, I want to be authenticated before I send it out. So, hey, yes, I'm authenticated. That user has another uh, uh, request. If I want to keep track or I want to do anything like rate limiting, I want to do that first before I let them do anything else. Uh, so to me, that makes sense. Uh, but I'm going to draw a picture to see if that can help. So in that case, all of your services underneath the gateway are not publicly accessible, right? So we put everything behind the gateway. The gateway is the only thing accessible. And that's how you basically can interact with the services behind the gateway. So um, yeah, I think uh, I'm a little confused too on why you would want to forward that session to another service. But again, it depends yeah. on the architecture of your system. I'm kind of living in this world where I authenticated the gateway and then, hey, I'm calling, uh, you know, I'm using a token to call service A, service B, service C. So, you know, uh, I, I always say like, uh, do the login page first. Uh, but this is actually like the way that I think about things. Uh, I have some gateway that sits in front of stuff. Uh, and I have some uh, session store. Uh, for me, it's gonna be Redis. Uh, and what I wanna do is I wanna make sure like, hey, are you cool? Uh, and this is just kind of the way that I think. This is my default uh, architecture uh, spring. Uh, and that actually might be uh, tied to some others, right? Oop, some, Oop, let's do this one. Maybe a VFS or some GitHub. So the idea here is whatever my services are, Whatever these guys are, I've seen it. Um, I want to do all those checks and stuff first before I come back here. How? Why? I'm going to give you an example. If I am here, if I make multiple calls, uh, service A, B, and C, uh, if I'm changing anything in that session, it might be a good idea. So you can do things like, hey, what, what's going on? what's happening, I can request it, I can get data. Um, but this way, I am able to keep track and I can limit, I can make changes. And I know, hey, there's kind of that one source uh, for where things are. What are you doing in these other services? What are you wanting to forward? Why don't you want to store things in the session before you move forward? That's the, the follow-up question. But this is the way that I think about things. Uh, from the get-go, if I'm thinking anything that's that's going to be public, even my kids' uh, <laughs> uh, blogs, this is what things are going to look like. This is what things are going to look like. Hopefully that, that clarifies. Is this the same picture that you have uh, in your head? Uh, but we can definitely talk about that more. Um, cool. I will stop sharing.
maybe. Oh, here we go. Uh, cool. Hopefully that helped. But Rajiv, again, good questions. Hopefully that, that picture helped. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, what is the future of adopting the Kotlin language with the arrival of Spring 3? Will it be a trend to use Kotlin or Java? Kotlin is available in Spring 3.0 right now. You head over to start.spring.io. Yeah, you can select that as a language. I don't know what the trends are. I, I have to imagine Java is still the most popular above between Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. But um, yeah, Kotlin's definitely picked up steam over the last few years. Uh, and I know everyone who does use it is a big, big fan. So Yeah, and um, the things are getting closer, right? So one of the things, again, I'm not a big... Uh, Kotlin user, but one of the things that I'm I'm noticing and hearing uh, from the people that are much smarter than me is that Java is getting closer. You know this this uh, new schedule that we're on uh, around the JVM releases, uh, more and more things are being added. Java is not stagnant uh, with this new release schedule. The community is still moving forward, so those things are going to kind of uh, yep. get closer. Uh, I think in the near future. So yeah, I think you've got options. Hey, Fuel Snable, welcome. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that you've made the switch, that you've, you've come over. It's great to see you. Uh, Fuel Snable is one of our awesome community members. He's actually been on Whitney's show. Uh, and yeah, Java has records. Does Java have union types as well? Do not know. Don't, I would say no. <laughs> um, so when I think of union types, uh, Maybe in my head, or maybe you can help clarify. Uh, what I think of unions, I think of like sets and what I'm, a lot of stuff that I do in Redis. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly uh, what that might look like in a language construct. So I've seen that in like TypeScript. So TypeScript has like structs and unions, and you can say like this type, and then like a pipe, and then this type, and like combine the two. But gotcha. no, J Java doesn't have anything like that. But you can do that through composition and inheritance. So, mm -hmm. uh, Raji, you keep, I mean, Gateway always saves context, but not sure why we need a explicit save session filter. Oh, okay, perfect. That's the, that's where I want to get to. And I will follow up on that. I don't know the exact answer there, uh, but I will follow up with you on that. Good. Thank you. I'm glad that we got to circle back and, and dig deeper on that question. Uh, all right, JWTs is supposed to save you the effort of maintaining sessions, but when using CSRF in the config, uh, don't we need to go back to using a session in order to secure the site from CSRF attacks? Um, so this is a really good question. Yeah, and I would now. say CSRF, again, do not do not take what I'm saying and go off and tell all your project leads that they don't need to worry about it anymore. But CSRF is becoming less and less of an issue because of the browser standards and implementations. And we have things like the way cookies are, you know, they're, that is becoming less and less of an issue. Um, so I, I guess I would need to understand what exactly you're doing and then why you're trying to prevent, like, what are you, when you say you're preventing a CSRF tech, what, what does that scenario look like? Um, but yes, I mean, if you are present, preventing CSRF, then yes, you have to have a session in place. But again, a lot of times the things that I'm doing with JWTs and passing service to service communication, I'm not worried about a CSRF attack. Yes, and I will say, uh, I'll kind of go back. Uh, what I want to have at my gateway, back to my, my previous diagram, what I want to have mm -hmm. at my gateway is not that I'm just passing through, uh, doing authentication, uh, getting a JWT and say, oh, yep, that's been authenticated and keep on going. Right. Uh, I want to have the ability to do more. I want to have the ability to, um, yeah, to uh, log out, to log out from everywhere, to uh, shut things down uh, for a user uh, with JWT. Sometimes it's, it's more difficult to do that uh, yep. once you've uh, delivered a JWT. Uh, how do you make that JWT not valid? That adds a bunch of complexity if you're not using, uh, yep. yeah, something 
to keep track of those. Yeah, and then once you introduce on like an authorization server, now you're saying, hey, these are the clients that I expect to be coming in. So now you've added that extra level of security. These are the clients that I'm going to allow. This is how long I'm going to allow a JWT to be valid, and then you can invalidate them. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of things you can do on top of that. Uh Snable has some additional questions. I just don't have the answers about Scala, but then he does give a quick shout out. Whitney does an amazing job. Uh, well, you're definitely well, trying to catch up with her amazing production quality <laughs> and the way she delivers is just fun to watch. Whether you care about the topic or not, yeah. she seems to be able to make anything fun. And yeah, she, love Whitney. I just, so. Yeah, like I feel like uh, I'm going to steal a quote from, from my friend Wob. Uh, I feel like I could just listen to her read the phone book and it would just be fun. She would make it <laughs> interesting. Oh, we get to see her next week too. So that'll be fun. Yes. So look at yeah. that. <laughs> Still Christmas. And Nate. Yes. So yeah, it's going to be a oh, fun, little, fun little crew next week. Yeah. Uh, here's a good question. Spring is a platform that uses and abuses of proxies like CG Lib. Uh, we will have some official documentation to guide the necessary changes to great codes aimed at GraalVM. Well, first of all, when you upgrade to Spring Boot 3, a lot of those things are going to be taken care of. We understand that we've done this in the past. So the framework, a lot of the, the libraries, more and more of the projects have moved to the point where, hey, we understand that you're going to grow VM. We're going to take care of this stuff. So these projects in the Spring ecosystem are taking care of that for you. But on top of that, the team for all the things that they've done for their projects, let's say Spring Shell is one we were talking about and where Spring Shell is using proxies. The way that the Spring team has implemented these fixes for something like Spring Shell, let's say, uh, they've actually exposed the way that they do that for third-party libraries. So if you are creating these third-party libraries and you're using proxies under the covers, you actually get to implement the changes the exact same way that the Spring team did. So where like, the example of this is what we did. They expose all of that. So there's nothing hidden. This is an open source project. So you can do the exact same things for your libraries that the Spring team did for their libraries with this move to Spring Boot 3. Yeah. And so one video, I put out a video, I think two weeks ago now because of the holiday on, um, so there are some things in your code that you can do too. So there's a, a you know, there's an at configuration annotation one of the properties on there is to set proxy bean methods equal to false. And I got some questions like, what does that mean? I don't really understand what that is doing. Uh, so I went through a tutorial on what that means and that even in your own code, you could turn off these proxies. You don't need to like have proxies in your own configuration classes. And there's a way to turn that off. And you, you need to understand why that's on by default and how to turn it off. So go ahead and check that video out. Uh, head over to youtube.com slash at Dan Vega. Awesome. So yeah, boom. Are cloud providers ready to support Spring AOT apps? For example, in the context of Lambda, they use a lot of reflection for adding additional info, additional stuff. So I'm curious. Yeah, so uh, again, they, in the context of Lambda, they use a lot of reflection for adding additional stuff. So, but again, AOT is, if we're building a Spring app, we are basically saying, rip, you know, stop that. You can't use any reflection. You can't use any proxies. Go through, find all those, get rid of those. We have those hints to kind of fix that. Give me the nuts and bolts. Just give me the code. And that's what that native image that that is um, generated for you at the end. It's, it's that native image without all of that stuff, right? So that's why it, it's so fast. And again, that's why the build time takes a while because it has to do all that for you. Once it gets to a native image, yeah, cloud provider says, hey, here are the ways that you can give it to me. Some will allow you to upload a native image like AWS. Some will say, hey, native image, give it to me in the form of a container. So maybe you can generate a Docker container for it. Um, so yes, it is supported various ways for different pr providers, but yes, you can uh, create that binary and send it to um, whatever. Now, again, it's different. If, if, I'm, if I'm on a Windows machine and I create a binary for Windows, AWS may not support a Windows binary, right? So that's when you may need to wrap it in a container. But if you can target the target runtime, then yeah, uh, it, it's going to support that. I'll, I'll add 
uh, I'm a big fan of the things that the Graal VM can do. It, it's not uh, the solution for everything. But if you've got a thing that's running uh, in the cloud and it, you're paying for, for memory and ingress egress and uh, startup time, if those are things that are uh, affecting you, uh, some of those apps might save you a boatload of money. Maybe the performance uh, doesn't even matter, right? Uh, it's something that's getting called a million times a day, uh, whether it uh, reacts in one second or two seconds, maybe that's not the thing. It's the, the memory consumption that matters. You've got to do this kind of analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that we dig into later. Uh, but there are a lot of use cases where just that, by converting something from running in a JVM uh, to uh, ahead of time compilation statically linked binary, it's going to save a boatload of money uh, on infrastructure in the cloud. And yes, this, there are uh, companies, customers, folks just like you that have been doing this, taking uh, Spring Native, uh, the experimental project, Spring Native, and using it with Spring Boot 2 and taking that to production because the savings was so significant. So there are tons of options, but again, uh, it's, it's a static link binary. The clouds don't really have a whole lot to do uh, to be ready for something like that. It's, you're delivering most things, you're delivering things as a, a container uh, and it's gonna be running on something containerized. Uh, so yes, the clouds are absolutely ready for that. And we'll definitely be doing a lot more of this uh, serverless function, connecting the dots, what does that look like in the cloud? What does that look like in Raspberry Pi or on the edge? Yes, single sign-on needs single sign-out. Who is Whitney? Wiggity Whitney. Uh, we definitely have to uh, get a link here. Uh, we have a couple of links we need to add. Tanzu Developer Center. Uh, head over to Tanzu Developer Center and on there you will find uh, TV. So under TV, there's a bunch of different shows. We have this one, Spring Office Hours. There are some other shows like Whitney's show um, where she goes in and dives in and talks about a particular subject and does this whole uh, white, well, I don't want to call it a whiteboard. What is it called? A yeah, lightboard. The lightboard. Lightboard, right. yeah. Lightboard. Um, and, and she does, you know, she's a very good artist. She's drawing. She's got text on air and she ends up with this whole... Uh, board about the topic that they're talking about. So, yes, definitely check out Whitney Tanzu Developer Center under TV. Uh, you will find her show, Enlightening. Yes. Oh, it is so good. Uh, I'm trying to find her Twitter. Why am I having a hard time finding it? Because I don't know how to spell Wiggity. <laughs> Giggity. I always think of uh, Family Guy. Giggity. Uh, well, I'll keep on going. I'll find that link here in a sec. All right. Um, yes, Whitney is the best. Awesome. Awesome. Man, we have flown, flown through. Yeah. This has been awesome. Ooh, I want to talk about something else too. I know we're up against it, but um, let me throw this up here. And let me share my screen while you're looking for that. All right. So one of the things we were gonna we were gonna try and get into today was predictions, things we're interested in in 2023. I wrote about this in my article, um, kind of what I'm interested in 2023. But since it was brought up, I'm going to jump down to it. And one of the things that I'm really looking at in 2023 is artificial intelligence, Chat GPT in uh, specifically because I think it's just a really great service. It's amazing some of the things it can do. I've gotten a lot of questions around, is ChatGBT going to replace me as a programmer? Uh, the short answer is no, it's not going to. I mean, in the long term, who knows? Um, always be evolving, uh, staying with the times. But if you haven't seen ChatGBT yet, it's a really great AI service where you can kind of type in some question and get some answer to, right? But it's not just for um, normal questions. It's like, you know, what is two plus two or whatever. You can actually give it some really crazy prompts and there's like this whole community around crafting these prompts that you give to these AI engines. Uh, but you can even come in here and like ask for some code. So write a 
Spring Boot application that exposes a REST API. And it will go in and it'll say, okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Here's how you do that. And lo and behold, you get some code spit out. And this is really cool. One of the things I will say to this is the reason why this is not going to replace your job today is these answers are not always right. And <laughs> these engines don't have the ability to discern whether this is right or wrong. They're using the kind of neural networks that the, the machine learning algorithms that they've been given or trained to, to say that this is what I think is right. But we just don't know. Like this one actually looks a lot better. I've seen, you know, some CRUD APIs that come out that go, okay, that probably works, but that isn't how I would write it today. Maybe it's like picking some stuff up from, you know, a few years ago. Um, but so again, it's really cool. There are some really cool things that come out of chat GPT. And as far as disrupting the future of a programmer, sure. I think, yeah, absolutely. You can disrupt. I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to replace you as a programmer, but I think you should look at it instead of looking at it as a tool that's going to replace you, look at it as a tool that can help you. Um, go ahead and look at it as an, as a way to, you know, I've been looking at it as a way to like find my answers quicker. Like this, sometimes gives me a better indication of what I need to be searching for on Google if I can't find the right answer. So uh, I'm in love with ChatGPT and AI in general. I had a chance to play around with this service called MidJourney, which is like this AI image generator. Uh, I did. I was just playing around with some Spring Boot stuff and I came up with this image. This was created just from like crafting a prompt to create some images. So yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big... A uh, fan of some of the AI tools that are coming out, and man, it's going to be a fun year as far as AI goes. Uh, so we have some good chat over here. Uh, hey, yes, uh, both uh, agree that it's it's only as smart as the the data that it's got. It it can't <laughs> validate you know what it's telling you. Uh, it's just like, hey, this this seems like it it works based on what I've uh, combined from all the places. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, maybe it can replace, right? This is something that uh, I heard, uh, you know, somewhere along the way is like, hey, you know, uh, I, they're, they're spending millions of dollars a day to, to keep that uh, chat GPT up and running. Uh, and lots of people are using it. And my what I understood was, I guess, you know, some of the other uh, powers they be were like, oh, red alert, right? This is a, a game changer for some things that we're making a lot of money on. Uh, and so I would yeah. say that, I would say that too, is like, it can't explain its thought process. So like when you're writing code, you, you have handcrafted this code and you can now explain what you've done to someone else. More or less, when something goes wrong, you'll know where to look. If I just handed you a project full of 30,000 lines of code and it's not working, how are you going to figure out what's going wrong, right? Like, so yeah, I just, it's a great tool. It's, it's added, it's a tool in my tool belt. It's not replacing me as the tool, so. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I think it's, it's another nice tool to have. Uh, and I've definitely uh, reached out there a few times where I'm just like, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and it, it, it can help, but yeah, definitely can't copy and paste from it. It definitely, uh, <laughs> Asking the same question, having the same conversation two different times will definitely or has the potential to, to yield very different results. Yeah, I, I wanted I want to put together a video when I have some time on just like finding a few prompts. So if you have some like really good prompts of like applications ChatGPT Chat GPT is creating, send them over to me. I want to like do a video where I, I ask ChatGPT to do something, create it, and then we'll kind of debug the code and take a look at it and kind of, kind of critique it and go, well, here's what I would do different. So. And you and I talked before the show, we have a, a bunch of projects in our head that we want to work on for 2023. And at the heart of that is a lot of this, these, these AI technologies, like how could I use AI to assist in what I'm trying to do uh, as a developer, as DevOps, as automating all the things in my workflow. Uh, so I'm excited about that. If you're doing any AI ML, uh, you, audience, if you're doing anything like that, I was ring we'd love to hear about it. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of tuned into is um, at least one of the customers uh, 
that I'm uh, working with converting uh, purely for performance, uh, purely for the benefit uh, that the Spring ecosystem provides, they are converting their uh, Python uh, uh, ML and AI uh, to Spring for the performance. It matters at scale. Uh, and I'm interested to hear if anybody else is going down that path. Uh, there are going to be a lot of AI ML conversations that we're going to have later this year. Uh, but we're, yeah, we're still kind of uh, learning and going down that path ourselves. But there is going to be a lot of really cool things, I think, happening. You know, one of the predictions uh, for 2023, there's going to be a lot of really cool things happening in the spring ecosystem around AI and ML. Yeah, and it's funny. I just see, like, I, I, I just get bombarded by ads on the internet. But I, I see, like, every day I see, like, a new service that is, like, hey, uh, an AI copywriting tool. Almost all of them probably use ChatGPT, <laughs> and so it's like, okay, this, these are ten different ways to 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 do the same thing. So yeah. Uh, with Spring 3.x, we now have HTTP interfaces. Funny, I mean, Deshaun, we we're just talking about that before the show. What are the advantages and disadvantages compared to OpenFain? So I have a ton of experience with OpenFain. I know. Um, from a advantage versus using like a REST template or a web client. Uh, obviously, lots of less code. I can, you know, I kind of liken it to creating a repository in Spring Data. I define this interface and I get all these things kind of out of the box for me uh, without having to write some code. So I do the same thing in an HTTP interface. I get to just mark, you know, I create an abstract a method there that says, hey, I'm going to return a list of customers. Here's the uh, endpoint that I want to go to. It's a Git exchange or a post exchange. I, I find it just simplifying the code that I have to write. And I know OpenFain does something very similar, um, but I don't know the advantages or disadvantages over OpenFain. Is, Deshaun, are you aware if OpenFain is going to kind of stick around or what's, do you know what the plan is there? I am looking for Olga's talk. Uh, for her That's latest talk, she did. Yep, it, oh, well, the one that she did in uh, December. Right. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to find that, and I will post that link. Uh, but we've we've talked about uh, some of the things in previous episodes, uh, and I know that you also have uh, a really good video on the uh, declarative HTTP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. We're not going to get to it today, but we'll when we start working on this Spring Shell example uh, with some of the stuff I've been doing with YouTube, uh, I've written all that in, in uh, Spring Boot 3 using HTTP interfaces, so we'll get to it. Awesome. Uh, what else What else did we want to cover today? We, we had so many good questions. I hope... I hope in my head there's somebody that's over there like, oh yeah, that makes sense, and they're they're now unblocked and they're they're moving forward. I hope that somebody is is doing that right now. Uh, cool, a couple of blogs on ChatGPT. I'll have to look at this when I get a chance. I don't know the premise of your blog post because I haven't read it yet, but I also know that things have been crossing my mind too of like, what like what is like morally right when it comes to some of this stuff when it whether it's ChatGPT, uh, GitHub Copilot. So for me, these are all being trained by something out there, right? Like these, these, do, these answers don't come out of nowhere. So GitHub Copilot is being trained on millions of line, lines of code so it can kind of predict what you want to write. Is it, for me, like, like I, I guess GitHub Copilot I'm less worried about because I'm writing code and then adjusting it. But you know, when you talk about chat, chat GBT and you like say, here's a here's a paragraph. Go ahead and rewrite this for me. Are you morally okay with using that somewhere where you're making money? I'm basically making money off of something that has produced this for me based on other people's work, right? Are you okay with like images being created where, you know, I've seen some examples out there where it's like some of these AI image generators where they go create a cartoon-like image in the style of this person who does these types of images. So you're asking an AI generator to create an image based on this artist's work. And so for me, that kind of gets into a gray area. So that's one thing I'm going to be kind of wrestling with this year. I don't know, um, Art, what your blog post is about, but I'm definitely going to check it out. So thank you. Awesome. I 
posted a link. Uh, I hope I did that right to the Spring One Tour Tel Aviv playlist on YouTube on the Spring Developer Channel uh, that has a bunch of great talks uh, that are really recent and, and really cool. up to date. Um, and that reminds me that I think we haven't looked at, at the calendar today, but I think we're getting ready for another release of Spring Boot already. Yeah. Yeah, next week. Um, what is it? Spring. Oh, is it Spring Boot next week? No, no, two weeks. So two weeks. Spring Boot 3.0.2 on <clears throat> the 19th. Yeah, and we'll... Um... We'll talk about this if we have a show next week. Um, but one of those changes going into, I guess I can kind of share this. One of those changes going into Spring Framework 6.0.4 is something I found and I helped discover. Um, yes. So a request mapping without patterns should match both this and that. Um, so that's one of the items that I'm looking, that I've been kind of tracking uh, to see what's going on with it. So I'm excited to see uh, what happens there. Um, I, I, I think it's okay to share. I think I saw you tweet this uh, recently to uh, the idea that every bit in this open source, beyond Spring, in this open source community, when you find a problem, when when you have an opinion like, hey, you know, how come this was left? Or, or why doesn't this work the same anymore? Share it, use it, yeah. like, use your voice. It matters. Uh, I still get excited when an issue that I raise gets attention. It makes it to the next release like that. That's exciting to me. Uh, so tracking an issue that, that I created or even that I commented on, I am still amazed at how this works. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, it, it feels like this is the way uh, humanity should be, right? We're, <laughs> we're sharing and we're, we're helping each other out. Uh, right. it, it makes me feel good. I really appreciate being a part of this community. <clears throat> All right, time for maybe one more. I uh, see one more question here. I'm interested to know why Spring 6 replaced Java EE with Jakarta EE. Was there any specific history behind it? There is a lot of history behind it. Um, I don't know all of the history, but um, I know that Oracle basically had the rights to Java EE, right, at, at one point, um, or they still do. And the APIs for Java EE were not evolving. It kind of went stagnant. Uh, so the community kind of stepped up and said, hey, we want to take ownership of this. We want to evolve these APIs. And ultimately, uh, Oracle moved this on over to the Apache Foundation, but said, okay, you can have this, but not keep the same name. Uh, it needs to take on another name. And that uh, other name was Jakarta. So Jakarta EE is basically the old Java EE under a new package name that can now evolve and change. So we needed to move from Java EE to Jakarta EE because all other projects in the community were moving towards that. So things like Tomcat are now using Jakarta EE. And we didn't want to be stuck on the same versions of you know all these different projects in the ecosystem forever. So uh, we've evolved to Jakarta EE, and as Jakarta EE moves into different versions, uh, so will we. Also, fun little fact: I did not know this, but there is a. I don't even know if you know this, Deshaun. I was watching unrelated. I was watching a special on Graham Hancock on Netflix about kind of the history of mankind. And one of the specials he was talking about had to do with Indonesia. And in Indonesia, there is an island called Java. I did not know that. On the island of Java, there is a village called Jakarta. So I'm guessing that's where this came from. I did not know that until I was watching this. Uh, so that was really cool to see. So Jakarta, Java, um, inside of Indonesia, pretty cool stuff. Um, the Jakarta Java tidbits, uh, I I did get that from Josh. Uh, I just posted a link to a video that I think Josh explains the the Jakarta Oracle, how it changed because he is also a Java champion and he is very in tune with yep. uh, all the things that have happened along the way. Um, but I believe that that link that I shared uh, has some of that history if you're interested. Uh, it was not something that the Spring team did uh, outside of the ecosystem. It, this is a 
ecosystem movement uh, caused by upstream. So, yep. Hopefully cool. that helps. All right. All sorts of good oh. stuff today. This was, yeah. this was one. I would love to just come in and answer questions. Uh, well, you asked at the beginning, you said at the beginning yes. of the show that you would love to just have an episode where we get questions and answer them. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, you asked yes. and you shall receive. Uh, yeah, we, we had planned on, on showing some stuff, but I feel like what we would have shown, uh, yeah, I think what, what we did today might have helped more people uh, than what we had planned. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And, I like to, had, and I can do that demo later. Yeah, what we had planned is, is in our back pocket. We can always use that one. So Yeah. So wonderful. Cool. This is great. We're definitely running over. Yep. And, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for everybody, every one of you for being here. For Thanks sure. to you for the great questions. Thank you for the regulars that, that keep on coming back. Uh, we will definitely, uh, I'm going to go through and I'll look at the, the notes and I will try to answer as much of those questions that we didn't get answered. I will try to answer those uh, uh, with a GitHub repo or a, a tweet or something. Uh, let us know if you got open questions, hit that hashtag spring office hours uh, and let us know on all the places yeah for sure thanks again for showing up today thanks for all the questions again if you are in ohio or will be next week at code mash come find us uh, we are excited to be at code mash next week uh, really excited for this introduction to spring uh, so looking forward to that if you're in ohio if you're at code mash come by and say hi i uh, just want to you know, wish everyone a happy new year. I hope you guys had a great holiday. I hope you had some time to relax, maybe tinker around, work on some projects and get excited for the new year and what is to come. We have a lot to uh, do as far as this show goes. We have so many plans for it. Uh, so we're excited. We will uh, try and get out the next one. We're going to put together a schedule. Again, we will be together next week. So we're going to be talking about what we want in the coming weeks on this show. As always, we you know appreciate that feedback. If there are particular topics you'd like to see us talk about, uh, go ahead and let us know, and we'll do that. You can see at the real Dan Vega at Deshaun. You can find us on Twitter. Um, Spring office hours on the Tanzu Developer Center. Thanks again for showing up. Uh, first show of the new year is in the books, Deshaun. Let's we did it. Do it. I'll see Let's you go. next week. Thank you, Absolutely. everyone. Have a good one. See ya.